Hello and good evening. I'm Wendy Sechrist, Executive Director of the Idaho Workforce Development Council. And I'm Rod Grammer, President and CEO of Idaho Business for Education. Welcome to this special segment, which is part of the fourth annual Governor's Conference on the Age of Agility, the Future of Work. The first segment was at our annual summit on October 12th, where Governor Little, top thought leaders and practitioners, engaged over 600 of Idaho's employers, education and policy leaders for a half day program to discuss how Idaho can continue to thrive in this environment where we have rapid economic standard change and education delivery models. Tonight, through the work of our partner, Idaho Public Television, we're able to host this legislative panel to share thoughts on the pathways available to students, educators, and business leaders to meet the demands for 21st century skills that are needed to build our workforce. For our Mountain Standard Time audiences, this segment is following a 30-minute broadcast uh, uh, of highlights from our October 12th summit, which featured youth apprenticeships in Idaho. Our Pacific Standard Time audiences will be able to watch that segment via their Idaho Public TV channel immediately following this panel. Before we begin, we would like to thank Governor Brad Little for continuing to support this summit. And again, our partner, Idaho Public Television for making this possible. We would also like to thank our workforce development collaborators, the Idaho State Board of Education, the Department of Labor, the Department of Commerce, the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation, the Division of Career Technical Education, the State Department of Education, the Department of Corrections, the Idaho STEM Action Center, and the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare. Tonight, we are so pleased and grateful to have our legislative guests joining us, including Senate Minority Leader Michelle Stennett from Ketchum, Senator David Lent from Idaho Falls, Representative Chris Mathias from Boise, and Representative Paul Amador from Coeur d'Alene. Throughout the event, we will be monitoring questions from you and we'll do our very best to answer as many questions as possible. Uh, please submit those through the chat function uh, on your computer. Thank you. Our theme for this Future of Work event is agility. The last two years have proven to us that we are both agile and resilient as a state. Tonight, our, for our legislative panel, we will highlight a number of short clips from our October 12th summit and invite the legislators to respond with their thoughts and ideas. Our first clip tonight features Sean Kelly from the Dennis Technical Center here in Boise, speaking about what many are calling the demographic drought. This term refers to the current workforce environment created by the convergence of the pandemic with other social and economic factors. So let's watch our first clip. Talking about the pipeline, um... I think it was referenced earlier, MZ, a local um, Idaho company, put out a report back in the spring called the Demographic Drought. And so if you've not read that, if you're a school, a state entity, an employer, read that report because what, it, what it's saying is you, you've got threefold hitting us. You have the boomers retiring at, at a huge rate, two million more baby boomers retired than it expected because of the pandemic. You have the pandemic itself, which has changed work probably forever. Then you have a group um, of about 21, eight, well, really 18 to 34 year olds that have completely checked out of the workforce. And then you have um, the drop in birth rates. And so that's not going to change anytime soon. So as Crystal said, if you're not on the front end of this in five years, you could find yourself in, in real trouble trying to find skilled labor. Let's turn to our legislators. Representative Amador, to get us started, what are your thoughts on um, the role of government and education in aligning to this new norm and adapting to the demographic drought. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And, and uh, if you have the opportunity, definitely look at that MC report. Unfortunately, it's not going to make you have lots of warm and fuzzy feelings about the future of, of the labor force in, in the United States. But I think if you look at the reality, it, I think we all see it. If uh, just me going to the grocery store right now, uh, you'll just see wiped out shelves. And it's not necessarily because it's a supply and demand issue. It's a problem of, you know, the producers can't find a workforce, the, the suppliers can't 
provide a workforce. The transportation companies can't provide the workforce. The the you know uh, the stores can't find a workforce. And so I think we all see the the reality of it hitting us pretty quickly uh, as a re result of many things, including the pandemic. I, I think Idaho is interesting in that uh, we're second in the nation in job growth since the the beginning of the pandemic. So we're in a an interesting position, but it's mostly based upon in-migration, not necessarily uh, birth rates in Idaho. Uh, where I hail from, Kootenai County is an interesting uh, example because traditionally we have been a, a bastion for retirees, which uh, doesn't necessarily help our, our uh, workforce. I, I don't know what that's looked like in the last year. I think those uh, trends are going to have to be uh, played out. One of the things looking at the MZ report that I thought was particularly interesting, because we're going to have to look at non-traditional workforces, you know, in the future. One of the, the data points they, they took was that by 2062, the U.S. is going to have a shrinking population. Uh, so how do we how do we attract people into the workforce that not that are not traditionally there? And one of them was uh, an example, one in four female college students right now is a single mom. Well, what happens when the pandemic hits and, and you have to stay at home because uh, your kids are, are, are not going to school? Or the fact that approximately one in three children are raised in a single family parent uh, household. And, and so I think childcare becomes an incredibly important issue for creating a workforce in Idaho and across the country. And whether that means uh, uh, family and friends taking care of children, that means a, a local uh, network of uh, families in the neighborhood, or that's a traditional child care center, I, I think child care becomes an incredibly important issue for us to focus on developing a workforce that can provide the, the uh, products and services that we need for, for the future of Idaho. Senators Lent and uh, Senator Representative Mathias, um, do you have any example? I mean, Representative Amador, you know, brought up a, a good point that employers are having to um, to change the way they do business. Are you seeing any examples um, from local employers that you want to comment on, or Representative Amador, if you have some examples, that'd be great. Um, this is Senator Stanett. Um, we are realizing not only because of how education is, but how much we are going to pay the workforce. That is changing rapidly and it has to compete with housing. And so if you're constantly paying only to where it is half of your income to make sure you can afford for your housing and your expenses, then it is going to make it extraordinarily difficult to keep people within a community because they just can't afford to stay. And that is happening all over Idaho because of the big boom of population that has, has come to live with us and the deficit, um, which we'll probably get into more than once about what's happening demographically, but also um, just the affordability uh, in our communities to keep uh, workers and employers together in order to make a, a business work. And it has um, really impacted particularly um, larger urban centers that have gotten smack, like where um, Representative Amador is or the Treasure Valley certainly has for the um, communities that are uh, the tourist communities like my area in order to serve the folks that are transient numbers swell and and we just don't have the workforce to accommodate it. So they're going to have to be an understanding of not only do you have the skills, you're desperate to bring employees in and you will encourage them any which way you can to, um, whether it's a benefit or a wage, or maybe they provide housing where there's no housing, it's just going to have a lot more um, diverse angles that you'll have to cover in order to encourage a workforce to stay. Well, and that's a, a great segue into our second clip. Thanks, Senator Stennett. Um, our, our second clip features Governor Brad Little speaking directly about the labor shortage in Idaho. One of the benefits of this labor shortage is employers are starting to reach down and pick up uh, younger and younger people. Uh, whether they're working at a restaurant and even the most menial job that teaches you to show up on time, uh, get along with the fellow employees, uh, learn a skill, uh, work with the public, those, 
those are skills that are applicable uh, from the lowest job in a company to the CEO. Those are all skills that are important. And of course, uh, always learn to work hard. Representative uh, Matthias, um, I'd like to ask you coming out of that clip, what are you seeing employers doing to help fill their workforce needs? Thanks, Rob, for that question and that clip. Um, you know. I'm obviously seeing a lot of the same things that were just mentioned, a lot of the same things that everybody else is seeing, you know, like help wanted signs. You know, there's a shortage of labor, there's shortages of persons participating in certain segments of the labor market. I'm also seeing as someone whose first job was at a McDonald's making $5 an hour, I'm seeing a significant rise in starting wages, but businesses are doing what they can. They're paying more, they're, they're being creative and competitive and attracting talent, but some of their needs and their ability to acquire those needs, in my, in my estimate, they're outside of their direct or their sole control. So I'm also seeing an overall shift in what it means to have a healthy business climate generally. I think the old way of thinking was, you know, if the legislature, if the government cuts my taxes, cuts my regulations and gets out of the way, I will have everything I need to be successful. And the new way of thinking, and this was alluded to by Senator Stennett and Representative Amador, is that we also have to recognize that in order for our businesses to be successful, they have to have employees and they have to have employees and families that can be successful. And I think that's gonna require housing, uh, daycare, some of the things that Representative Amador and Senator Stennett mentioned. So I think coming up with, you know, addressing those peripheral needs of businesses is gonna be essential. So what do they need to answer your question? Well, they obviously need talent, but I think by working together with partners, some of which were mentioned at the beginning of the call today, I think they need a reliable talent pipeline that will serve not only their current needs, but also as the governor mentioned uh, in, in response to one of those questions during his conference, but we also need to prepare that pipeline to address the needs of the future. So we have a question from one of our uh... Uh, listeners about red tape, um, that sometimes employers are reluctant to bring high school students on because of red tape and other regulations. And uh, the person is asking, you know, besides maybe dealing with some of the red tape, are there incentives that uh, can be provided to employers to bring on interns and apprentices and things like that? Uh, I'd love to hear from the other uh, uh panelists, but I did have a chance to have a conversation with a credit union CEO uh, not too long ago. I asked that question. I said, what are the challenges of, of hiring high school students to be interns and apprentices, for example? And his response was red tape is a challenge, but it's not the traditionally assumed red tape in you know, the business and commerce section of code. Some of it are educational and school system requirements that require students to be in certain places at certain times. So um, I, I would suggest that red tape needs to be cut not just by itself, but in a larger context of what are the systems at play that are complete, you know, putting pressures on students and families and employers at the same time. So our third clip, um, in, in education, we know that all things are not created equal uh, between rural and urban Idaho. Uh, but this next clip, I think, shows that there are significant innovations going on uh, to connect our youth to entrepreneurships uh, like uh, what's happening in Clark Fork, one of our rural school districts in Northern Idaho. And it may address a little bit what that last questioner was, uh, was getting to. So let's look at that clip. We have to make a company and then we have to sell and make a profit off of the stuff that we make. And me and my friend Wyatt are making exhaust tips. And this of course, it's still a prototype, but he likes the idea very much of making, you know, aftermarket parts for trucks. Before we even got to make that, we had to make a full presentation on uh, like who would be interested in buying these, if we would actually make a profit, how hard will it be. You know, if you go through the financial analysis, you have to decide for yourself, is that something that I can support myself with? And if it's not, then you have to add to it. If it is, you know, then you have to fight for it, really. If we could get 50% profit, that would be really good, but yeah, I'm not sure. Starting with Senator Stennett, um, what thoughts do you have on cultivating the next generation of entrepreneurs in Idaho, both in our rural and urban areas? Um, do you think that the education system purposely creates a climate for this? There's so much to say about this. Um, when the Age of Agility panel, they were talking about um, how important it is to have durable skills. 
And so the durable skills, which we used to call soft skills, but they're more important than soft skills. Um, and and I, I think the governor alluded to this, and I know in, in the conference, um, Tim Taylor talked a bit about this. What can we do with what they know? And that's so much about what employers are hiring now and what they're seeking for having at all ages and the ability to do the job is to be able to solve problems it isn't a higher degree that you necessarily need, um, that you have to be creative, that there's a, a nature of innovation, which is what these kids in the clip are talking about, that there is so much you can do. And when, when we talked about the demographic drought, what we need to, to understand is boomers did um, employment differently and education, they were educated differently. And then we got the Xers who are a very small population and will not fill all the holes just by numbers for what the boomers are vacating before the millennials come on. And we all know the millennials are never gonna do jobs the way we all did it historically with all the prior generations. And so when we talk about education, speaking to rural and urban centers, the way that we want to educate and how the education systems will need to be able to um, adapt to to not only different um, teaching environments, different learning environments, different demands by employers, when you're really talking about a person um, being able to um, not necessarily need those technical skills that we've been training towards, that we've been educating towards, that it is a more universal, um, do they have a, an, are they inspired? Do they have an aptitude? Do, um, are they creative about it? Is it something you can keep their interest? Um, can you be a little more flexible in the work environment? These are things that we haven't historically taught in our education system. And um, we need to pool all those ideas together and be much broader thinking about the types of employees that we're putting out there into the workforce. And it is going to be a painful transition because it isn't the same old way that we as boomers moving out had learned and how how um, the markets always worked. As you and I know, uh, Wendy, we look at this all the time of what are all the different things with the Workforce Development Council that we can bring people on in both rural and urban centers because we understand this lag in the rural area where we can upscale them in any fashion that we can, whether it's certifications or apprenticeships or um, inspiring them to be the companies to be entrepreneurial in smaller communities. It really is going to be have to be a much broader faceted education system and workforce from the styles of the of the of the um, the incoming employees that we have to um, this whole idea of having good solid um, importantly, these good solid skills, these durable skills that really don't need to be technical for them to be marketable. And um, because of that. Um, uh, not having to have your four-year degrees and to have a certain kind to make sure that we encourage them to be part of that. So I think that um, uh, all levels of learning and it'll have to be a more of a universities working together, um, technical groups working together, those all of those uh, teaching entities to be able to do this on all levels in all communities. Um, is going to be a, a bit of a transition, but they're already working towards that if we, as we have seen. And uh, the, any which way we can inspire um, all of our new workers coming into the workforce to have a passion for what they do, we have to expose them to that in some capacity. And I think that's where we, where we can really uh, make a difference and create those programs. Um, so we had a couple of questions come in about um, incentives, both on, you know, incentivizing work-based learning, so internships, apprenticeships, and then also um, incentivizing, you know, young people to start their own businesses. Um, what, what thoughts do, do any of you have on, on that? I mean, I know Senator Stennett being on the council, you know, we've put in, into uh, practice an incentive for hiring apprentices um, through the Workforce Development Training Fund, but others, what are your thoughts on, on incentives there? Oh, this is Senator Lent. You know, uh, I think we need to do a better job at starting earlier in the K-12 process to help our students think in terms of those things. Think in terms of what would I like? What are my interests? We do a few things now, but we're not as effective as we could be. And if you think about our current education system, it's primarily built on efficiency. Uh, you know, the hallmark education 
is really student engagement. And so in the last clip we saw, you could tell those students were very engaged. They were thinking about uh, their future. You know, he's thinking about 50% profit. Uh, you can bet every minute that those students had, that's not a one hour per day experience for them. It's probably most of their day they're thinking about those things. So this becomes part of the rethinking of the way we uh, implement our education system. Uh, not so much teacher centered and didactic, but more student centered with teachers that facilitate. They're more facilitators using all these new technologies that we have now uh, to bring to bear, to help bring more individualized instruction that really pursues those interests of those individuals. Well, that is uh, another great, oh, Representative Mathias, I see you've got your hand up. Thanks, Wendy. I just wanted to, to piggyback off something the good senators mentioned, you know, our system is built on efficiencies, which, you know, builds in advantages to our more urban communities where economies of scale can be achieved. And I think that's something that we do need to address, certainly as a legislator or as a legislature, as someone who grew up in a rural community, I was a CTE student in high school and we didn't have the facilities that I needed. And I had to spend a lot of time traveling to another town to go to my courses. And I think those types of disincentives are built into our rural communities. And again, like the good Senator mentioned, I think those are the types of things that we could address in our public school system. Well, let's um, transition to the next clip where our keynote speaker, Tony Wagner, talks about the efforts um, to develop a model of education in Idaho that's based around proficiency that, that gets those kids excited about learning. I came to discover that there's a lot of very exciting things already happening in Idaho. You have a uh, mastery-based education initiative in the Department of Education led by Aaron McKinney. And right now there are about 40 schools involved in trying to develop a, a, a model of learning that is about proficiency or competency or mastery-based learning. You see, I believe that a high school diploma should be a collection of merit badges. Again, if I were to ask you to raise hands, I'm sure lots of you were involved in scouting in one way or another. And I think it is the model. A high school diploma today, or even a college diploma is often merely a certificate of seat time served. I served my time, so I got my critic. I got my Carnegie unit, whatever it happens to be called. Whereas there is no real skill that our many of our high school graduates leave school with. And I think a fundamental answer to Idaho's skill and employment issue is really rethinking the nature of K-12 education, but particularly high school, and ensuring that a high school diploma is a certificate of mastery, a certificate of proficiency. And Aaron and his colleagues in, the, in those 40-odd schools are working in that direction. General Lent, uh, my question for you coming out of this clip is, right now, as Tony said, we have about 40 schools in Idaho that are teaching mastery or competency-based education. But in Idaho, we have uh, uh, 116 school districts roughly and, and plus charters. How do we take mastery-based education and scale it up in a way that we get some critical uh, uh, mass there? Thanks, Thanks Rod. That's a great, great question. Um, it's interesting to note that we just went through probably once in our lifetime kind of a disruptive event. Uh, for the last 40 years or so, we've been working on uh, innovative ways to improve uh, education. But at this point, we had something that is significantly different than anything we've seen before. The reason I bring that up is it, it gives us an opportunity. He said earlier about uh, thriving or surviving. And at this point, the opportunities to thrive would include, how do we take advantage of this point in time? And that includes a couple of things. So when it comes to mastery, that is part of this engagement and more an individualized model in the use of technology and facilitation of learning. Uh, it's interesting to note, most people don't realize that, you know, less than 60% of, uh, or more than 60% of our population in the state never graduate from college. And with that being said, their primary education then becomes K-12. And the question we probably should ask ourselves is, is K-12 really providing uh, the best opportunity for students 
and the best return on tax dollars for those paying those taxes. So here's a couple of suggestions, I think, as I thought about this that might, might come into play. One of them is that we do a much better job in that middle school piece. Uh, we need to have career exploration starting at just as late as the eighth grade. We put more emphasis on that uh, career plan. And we also do something unique. In Idaho, we have a great program called Advanced Opportunities that we provide funding for students so they can actually get a two-year degree paid for while they're in high school. If we can get some alignment with those career plans and that money, that scholarship money that the state's providing, I think we can be more effective in the utilization of those do dollars. The other thing I would add to that is more parental involvement in that, uh, that latter part of the K-12 uh, phase. He mentioned that that's the part we really need to think, rethink, and I would agree 100%. Uh, if you think in terms of that uh, K-8 is where they foundationally learn how to function in society, to read, write, communicate. And then if we allow them more freedom in that, in that uh, 9, 10, 11, 12, as we rethink, and here again, I'm setting back saying, here's some options that we might consider is if we rethink that last four years, let them be more individualized, let them go as fast and as deep as their interests will take them. And if they're academically bound, let's not hold them to the date they were born as how they can progress through the system. Uh, we have technology in place now, I think that really is a game changer. And uh, you know, we've been at this, this incremental change, like I said, for the last 40 years, we have an opportunity now. And I think with you, uh, Rod, you and Wendy and the governor and those who are supporting this, we've got the right people involved the State Department of Education to really make a significant move as far as leadership is concerned in the state of Idaho. We can turn that survive into a, th into a thrive. So uh, I am a believer in mastery-based. You know, I spent 40 years in the nuclear industry and 20 of that as a training manager. And I really understand and appreciate that concept of knowledge and skill and how they work together to bring relevance to the learning process. So if it's relevant, it tends to stick and do much better. So we're back to that issue that I was talking about with effectiveness. So Senator, do you think, yeah, you mentioned the advanced placement, we do spend a lot of money on that, millions of dollars. Are you suggesting that perhaps we could use some of that advanced opportunities funding to for career exploration and also maybe even use some of that money for work-based learning? that can help uh, students explore careers. Absolutely, and I think that's part of the change we have to make. Our paradigm has to shift to we really start them back in about the eighth grade. And we have money funding that's already out there that we're spending on uh, advanced opportunities. And unfortunately, we haven't seen the gains that we really expected there originally. So uh, as a school board member and shaking those students' hands for many years that came across the stage, and realizing that they had no clue what they were gonna do the next day. They were just gonna figure it out. Their goal was to graduate from high school. We've missed the boat, it's too late. So I think it's essential that uh, we go back in, the, in middle school and the states that we've looked at, they're very strong in that model. They're strong in that model of middle school, get them started on career exploration and don't take them away from anything and don't track them, but provide opportunities and ladders for them to a scaffold into something they're interested in. And it's more effective for them and it's more effective for the educational process. So I know we, we knew that when we started this that uh, the, the time was gonna go very, very quickly tonight. Um, Representative Mathias, I, I just saw your hand up. Do you wanna? Uh, yeah, thanks. I just wanted to uh, piggyback off something Senator Lentz said. He mentioned higher education. He mentioned the scalability of mastery. You know, higher education faculty, subject matter experts, assessment experts are going to have to be involved in, in designing, you know, well-tailored assessments, whether we're talking badges or other micro-credentials. Uh, he also mentioned leadership. You know, we tend to think of higher education through the prism of the perceived politics of individual faculty and staff. But in my experience at the State Board of Education, what we often forget is that higher education institutions are extremely conservative institutions and it really requires sometimes forceful and other times graceful leadership to really usher them along into the new future. 
So it, just as a, a last question um, to put out to all of you, we, one of our, our um, viewers asked about, you know, what ideas um, do you have that the legislature can do to help support the workforce for the future? Uh, so I'm going to leave, leave it at that. Senator Stennett, your hands up. So you get to go first. Well, it was, inter it was interesting because I think Sarah in the, in the chat posted something that is spot on and I want to give the shout out to it because we've talked about this. It is so hard to plan education around something we don't know that it, how it's going to exist into the future because the technologies, the demands, what employers need are changing so rapidly that we're already behind by the time we're teaching it. But I think um, what we need to remember is exactly what we've been talking about and what she said is your experience, your work, um, how we prepare them for being strong communicators, critical thinkers, we always talk about that. Um, those are, uh, again, that, that uh, durable skill. Those are things that are universally applied to most anything you choose to be as, as a solid, good employee um, for an employer that they're all seeking for. And in, I, I hope that we can get back a little bit to um, the employer then will take a, a, a solid employee who has those um, skills and that aptitude and train them for the particular technicality of what that business needs. And they're so unique, education can never teach everything that a particular employer needs specifically. And so this has got to be a much broader collaboration uh, amongst industry and educators. And um, I think it's an exciting future. It can be very innovative. It will take us out of our normal, our normal process, but it can be something that um, will be open up to a lot more of the, the student force everywhere if we can uh, make sure we put our resources together to, to broaden that, that, that platform. Thank you. Representative Amador? Thank you. I'll be super brief because I know we're short in time, but one of the issues that we haven't even broached and is, I think, incredibly important to the future of the workforce. And I, it was covered in a conference that I went to a couple of years ago is the gig economy. Uh, so many of our, our, our especially our uh, younger population are involved in the gig economy. And, and that plays a huge uh, issue around uh, legislation and, and social infrastructure as far as uh, supporting taxation and um, you know support for Medicare and Medicaid and and uh, you know various different issues that are going to be incredibly important for us to to figure out over the next uh, few decades to determine the the future of what not only our workforce looks like but our our government and our support infrastructure looks like. So just something to throw out there to to consider. Absolutely, Senator Lent. Again, very quickly. Uh, to the question about legislation and support of roadblocks, uh, please anyone listening to this, contact your legislator or one of us, and we would be more than happy to understand your particular challenges and uh, leverage those into legislation that would make it easier for us to participate with you. I've said it for a long time that we've existed as business and industry setting at the table when in fact they probably should have been conducting the meeting with the educational facilitators. Yeah, and, and you know, I think that's one of the huge benefits that we have in Idaho is that um, our, our, our elected officials are very, very accessible. So um, I, I know that when Senator Lent says, reach out to me, that he means it. Um, Representative Mathias, any last thoughts? No, this this is a, this has been a great panel. I, I think just the, uh, to the question of what what's the legislative role in addition to all of this, in addition to being a good faith participant with all of the, the stakeholders that are that really care about this, I think one of the things the legislature can do is a little bit better job of speaking more clearly and forcefully on the education issues that matter the most to the most people. And I think the things we're talking about tonight are precisely those things. Right. Well, thank you again, Senator Stennett, Senator Lent, Representative Mathias, and Representative Amador for joining us in this conversation tonight. And we'd also like to thank Idaho Public TV for hosting us uh, tonight. And just a reminder to our friends in the Pacific Standard Time, uh, immediately following this panel, in fact, right now, is uh, a program on your local Idaho pu Public TV station with highlights from our October 12th summit for 
in the age of agility. So uh, once this is over, go to your set and, and tune into that special program. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.